Hello everybody, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to the White House. Uh, before I get started, I would like to read to you something I am still looking for. Here we go. Uh, a readout of the President's calls with Speaker of the House John Boehner and Majority Leader Harry Reid. Today, the President made separate phone calls to Speaker Boehner and Leader Reid. In his call to Speaker Boehner, the President reiterated the need and his commitment to work with Congress to extend the payroll tax cut for the entire year, and the fact that the short-term bipartisan compromise passed by almost the entire Senate is the only option to ensure that middle-class families are not hit with a tax hike in 10 days and gives both sides the time needed to work out a full year solution. The President urged the Speaker to take up the bipartisan compromise passed in the Senate with overwhelming Democratic and Republican support that would prevent 160 million working Americans from being hit with a holiday, uh, with a holiday tax hike on January 1st. The President also spoke with Leader Reid and again applauded him for the work he conducted with Minority Leader McConnell to achieve a successful bipartisan compromise that passed overwhelmingly in the Senate on Saturday, and Senator Reid reaffirmed his commitment to secure a bipartisan year-long tax cut after the House passes the two-month extension. The, pres the President urged the Speaker to allow a vote on the one compromise <coughs> that Democrats and Republicans passed together. Mr. Speaker? Did you mean the Senate? Yes. The the President urged the Speaker, returning to the Speaker here, to allow a vote on the one compromise that Democrats and Republicans passed together to give the American people the assurance they need during this holiday season that they will not see a significant tax hike in just 10 days. Uh, those calls uh, took place within the last half hour. Did you get an answer from either one? Uh, that's the uh, extent of the readout I have for you. Gee, given the calls, are, is the White House more <coughs> confident at this point that the, uh, some sort of compromise could get through to prevent this tax hike? <coughs> the compromise exists. It is embodied in the Senate bill that was supported by 90 percent of the United States Senate, Republicans and Democrats alike. It is available even now for the House to vote on. Unfortunately, thus far, the House leadership has refused to allow the House of Representatives to vote on that measure, which has overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, we urge uh, the House leadership, Speaker Boehner, to reconsider that position, to allow the Senate bill to come up, to allow the House of Representatives to vote on it, uh, because we are confident that it would pass uh, with both Democratic and Republican support. I, I know you all are aware, because many of you have been reporting on it, on the growing chorus of Republicans who are calling on Speaker Boehner and the House leadership to do the right thing and to pass this bipartisan compromise so that Americans don't have their taxes go up in 10 hours, uh, 10 days and 11 hours. That's the result of failing to act. Taxes go up. The bipartisan compromise exists. It was worked out uh, by the Senate Democratic leader and the Senate Republican leader uh, in a process that was uh, agreed upon with the Speaker of the House <clears throat> that produced a result that the Speaker of the House told his own membership that he supported and that he recommended they support. They should just get it done. And then we can all, the Senate, the House, the administration, work on extending the payroll tax cut for the entire year, a commitment this President has made from the beginning when he was the first to put on the table through the American Jobs Act a payroll tax cut extension for 2012. But we have to get this two-month extension done or else taxes will go up on the American people. And it really, it, it really is not that difficult. The House has the ability to call up the Senate legislation, pass it, uh, and move on. And taxes will not go up. The average American family will not have to worry about uh, how to make ends meet with $1,000 less next year. So we urge them to do that. That's what the President urged the Speaker to do uh, just moments ago. Would the White House and Congressional Democrats be willing to give some sort of <coughs> ironclad commitment to pass a full year's uh, 
tax extension by a certain date early in 2012 in, 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 uh, you know, in exchange for passing this two-month extension. The, the president is committed to a one-year tax cut. That's what he's been pushing uh, both here in Washington and around the country since September as part of the American Jobs Act and then as, when it was separated out from the American Jobs Act. Senate Democrats, House Democrats are all committed to doing that. Republican leaders of both houses say they are committed to doing that. Um, it can be done. Uh, so uh, it would require finishing the work that Senators McConnell and Reid started as they tried to reach a year-long agreement. They made good progress, but work needed to be done, which is why they then moved to the two-month extension to ensure that Americans didn't have their taxes go up. Uh, that is the sensible thing to do. Pass the two-month extension, return to work on the year-long extension. Or else, explain to the American people, 160 million of them, why Congress uh, would not listen to them, would not listen, why the House Republicans would not listen to their Senate colleagues, would not listen to Republican elder statesmen and stateswomen all around the country and the city telling them to do the right thing here. It's bad for the country, and uh, it's, it's bad for the economy, and it's bad for the American people not to pass this bill. Uh, so we, you know, we feel very strongly about it, as you can tell. Does the President uh, expect to hear back from Speaker Boehner on whether uh, this might be an option? Uh, look, I, I think it's pretty clear, again, not, not because I say it, but, but many others uh, are also saying it, that the ball is in uh, the House's court. There is a compromise available an avenue out of this blind alley, if you will, that they've driven themselves into. Uh, and it is uh, the Senate bill. Vote on it, pass it, and we can move on to discussing and figuring out uh, a solution for the year-long extension. Um, Senator Corker, Republican from Tennessee, I know what's going to happen, and I agree with the editorial this morning in the Wall Street Journal. Probably the best thing to do at this point is just get this behind us and move on, urging the House Republican leadership to change course and endorse a compromise reached uh, in the Senate that got the support of 90 percent of those members, Democrats and senators alike. Senator McCain, it is harming the Republican Party. It is harming the view, if, if it's possible anymore, of the American people about Congress. So do the right thing. Pass the payroll tax cut. Make sure Americans don't have their taxes go up on January 1st. Uh, <coughs> yes, Alex. Jay, um, just staying with this theme. So, specifically, what is the president offering uh, the speaker in return for sort of reversing himself on this? You misunderstand here. There is not. This is not a. This is not a game of poker, high stakes poker, as one Republican congressman deemed it. We're talking about 160 million Americans and their paychecks. There's no political quid pro quo here. There was a bipartisan compromise reached with uh, overwhelming support from Republicans and Democrats in the Senate at the direction of the Republican leader in the House that initially garnered the support of the Republican leader in the House. Uh, and let's review some history here. The President and Democrats initially supported, put forward the American Jobs Act, which was paid for entirely, including the payroll tax cut extension and expansion. Uh, and, and, and the pay-fors in that bill uh, were what the President very firmly believed uh, that if he could have his way entirely uh, was the way it should be done. When Republicans blocked that and the Senate Democrats crafted a separate payroll tax cut extension with UI extension and some other measures, and tried to move it uh, and have it paid, through, paid for by asking the 300,000 wealthiest Americans, millionaires and billionaires, to pay a little extra. Republicans blocked that. So we compromised. <coughs> President, Senate compromised. And the deal that was passed, the compromise that was passed by the Senate by a vote of 89 to 10 did not have the pay-fors that the Democrats wanted, did not have the pay-fors that the President initially <laughs> submitted, but they had a compromise set of provisions that paid for it uh, that won the agreement of 89 senators, including 39 Republicans. That is uh, 
the essence of compromise. It, 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 the, the bill even included uh, an extraneous political victory that Republicans insisted on. And let me try something else, but same with the thing. The CR runs out on Friday. When will the President sign the omnibus? When it gets here. What happens if it hasn't got here? It will get here. I'm sure it, it, if it, it I don't, I'm not sure if it's physically here yet, but when it, when it arrives, there's a, there's a process in the, uh, in that, uh, uh, August institu institution that takes time in terms of producing uh, the bill for him to sign, but he will sign it when he gets here. Right. And on Syria, what do uh, additional steps to pressure the Assad regime mean? What are you talking about that specifically? Uh, the, uh, the fact is that the matter is, is that we have throughout this process uh, worked both unilaterally and collectively to increase pressure and isolation on the Assad regime. Uh, what you've seen uh, is a continuation of horrific acts of violence, uh, needless violence against the Syrian people. And it's clear that every metric shows the situation is moving against Assad. Defections uh, of the military are on the rise. Diplomats have begun leaving their posts and coming out in support of the Syrian opposition. The opposition is more unified, more inclusive. The regime has been cut off by the Arab League, by its traditional allies and neighbors like Turkey. And the regime is under increasing financial duress due to international sanctions and weak domestic economic policies. It is only a matter of time before this regime comes to an end. Only fear is holding it together. Uh, and governing that is based on fear is always doomed to fail. Are you talking about sanctions or what? Uh, you know, I don't have uh, details to provide to you about additional measures we will take, but we will continue to pressure, uh, working with our international partners, the Assad regime, and uh, the writing is on the wall. The isolation uh, increases, and uh, you know, more and more members of the international community of nations are, are, uh, are joining the call for Syria to stop this uh, atrocious behavior. Um, yes, yes. Um, clearly the President will stay in town to sign the omnibus, uh, but now he said it's up to the Speaker to take make the next move. So what is the President's next move? Will he go join his family in Hawaii? Uh, I don't have any uh, scheduling updates to give you. Uh, we are obviously in a pretty fluid situation. Uh, but the President made clear in his call to Speaker Boehner earlier today as I made clear in the readout, uh, that the action that must be taken is the House needs to take up the Senate bill that was uh, supported by an overwhelming percentage of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate and pass it to make sure the taxes don't go up. Which is to say he has no intention of negotiating. There, the negotiating has happened already. It is not, uh, as I just explained, it is not at all the case that this is uh, simply the President saying, uh, here's what I want and do it. This was a compromise worked out by the Republican leader in the Senate, with the Democratic leader in the Senate, with the uh, approval, in fact, even the instigation of the Speaker of the House. So the Wall Street Journal today opines that the President has won this battle politically, um, to paraphrase, not quote them. but. Um, if the payroll tax cut is not extended, the economy, most econ economists are, are saying, will suffer. So how concerned is the White House that if it, it doesn't get extended and the nation's economy will take a big hit? We are very concerned uh, of two things, the micro and the macro, if you will. The macroeconomic effect on growth uh, that uh, not extending this tax cut, not extending unemployment insurance would have. Uh, outside independent economists, uh, not the ones who seem to disagree with basic economic fact, uh, say that it could have uh, a negative impact of up to 0.5 percent of GDP. We firmly believe that in the end, because there is such uh, now overwhelmingly overwhelming support for the payroll tax cut and extending it for a year, that this will get done. We believe that uh, eventually the House leadership, House Republicans, will understand that um, this is not about giving President Obama a victory. This is about uh, 
exercising uh, their authority on behalf and at the demand of the American people, a bipartisan consensus of the American people as represented by the enormous bipartisan vote in the Senate. Uh, it's the right thing to do. And at the microeconomic level, we're worried about individual families who need that extra money, an average of $40 a paycheck. Uh, as you know, on Tuesday, the White House called on Americans to add their voice to the conversation here in Washington about why we need to extend the payroll tax cut. Uh, if, if Congress fails, if the House fails to act, the, tip, uh, act, the typical family making $50,000 a year will have about $40 less to spend or save with each paycheck. That adds up to about a thousand bucks for the year. Uh, the response has been extraordinary. Uh, over 17,000 submissions, I think, is the, the last uh, information I got. Uh, someone uh, contacting us from Connecticut says, I can buy lunch from the cafeteria for almost a whole month for my twins. I can buy food or pay for gas. I can save it for my daughter's prescriptions. Uh, prescription deductibles. To some people, $40 is nothing, but $40 is big money for us. In West Virginia, uh, someone wrote in saying, after everything that comes out, including my mortgage, my take-home pay is $150 every two weeks. So minus 40 would be $110. I can barely get by now. That 40 bucks is my gas for my car to get to work. Taking 40 away from my pay would just about put me under. This matters. This is real, real stuff. This is not about high stakes poker or political brinkmanship. It's about 160 million Americans and their families and the impact that failure to act would have on them. Uh, and the voices are growing louder from average Americans, from Republicans in Congress, in the Senate, even in the House now, uh, from respected commentators within the conservative uh, arena, the House needs to act. They're not behaving in the interest of the country. We want to do this together with them. We want to work with the Congress, with Republicans and Democrats alike. That is how we achieve the compromise in the Senate that was authored, co-authored by Senator McConnell. It's time to get this done for the American people. Hey, Mr. Noller. Hey. Nice to have you in the front row. How are you? Well, thanks. Don't tell Noller. Um, <laughs> is the White House at odds with Speaker Boehner when he said earlier today that rather than do a two-month bill now, there is plenty of time left in the year for the Senate to come back, choose negotiators, and work out a year-long extension of the payroll tax cut bill? We disagree with that proposition because we need the insurance. We need to make sure that taxes do not go up on January 1st. And that insurance is the compromise two-month extension that was voted on by, a vo by 89 to 10 by Republicans and Democrats alike in the Senate. We are absolutely committed to working with Congress for a year-long extension. That's, you know, the President was out there uh, certainly without any Republican support in the beginning here in the fall pushing this. Um, you know, re Republicans have gone from opposing it to tepid support to now insisting that uh, it would cause uh, – that we'd rather have taxes go up on the American people on January 1st than create the uncertainty of a two-month extension. Let's take you back to that, for some of us, uh, 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 distant period in the summer when – Republicans were insisting that as part of the deficit, or rather the, the, the debt ceiling negotiations, that we return to the raising the debt ceiling every few months. And in fact, that we would return to it by the end of the year. You want to talk about an uncertainty that would create, be created for the economy. The threat of default, you remember what it was like in August. So their concern about the uncertainty of passing this two-month extension uh, uh, seems hollow to my ears. Yes. On another subject, yes, sorry, before Mark, you go ahead. let you go, um, is there any White House comment about um, eight American soldiers charged in the death of a fellow soldier in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, I apologize, Mark. I, I, uh, I haven't got anything for you on that, but I can take the question and get back to you. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, uh, Jay. Uh, there were reports that there were uh, 
three, I believe, Iranian, or sorry, five Iranian engineers that were captured in Syria um, working on a power plant. With the statement that you issued earlier today, you said that they're, you're condemning, I guess, the, the uh, Syrian regime and you are calling for action, um, I guess, banded the people in the region to band against the regime, but are you calling for stronger action? I mean, this is, or have you been speaking to your allies in the region to take stronger action against Syria? Because things are, I mean, especially with, with the Iranians now um, in the country, I mean, it seems that the things are ramping up there. Well, I, I would simply say that from the start of this process with regards to Syria, we have ratcheted up pressure on Syria. You have seen uh, the United States working with our partners, working with our allies, uh, participate in an effort that has increased international isolation of Syria. And so the steps we have taken have been uh, all in one direction, if you will, which is to put pressure on Syria to make clear that Assad uh, has lost his legitimacy to rule and to further isolate his regime uh, as we call on him to cease the violence uh, and to begin a democratic transition in that country. Uh, we will continue to take those steps uh, to pressure the regime uh, to stop its crackdown. I think as we've seen in terms of the by the reporting and by the international condemnation of what's happening in that country, the world is watching. Uh, and increasingly, Assad's legitimacy is, uh, has been lost around the world. And, and that process will continue. Are you aware of these reports of the Iranian engineers? I do, but I don't have anything, uh, I mean, I've seen the reports, but I don't have anything specific for you on that. Discussions with people in the region. I, I, I don't. I don't. Action. Again, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any response on that. Uh, let's go, Ed, and then Mr. Thanks, Jay. Um, yesterday, you were graciously answering my question about the president uh, on 60 Minutes, um, com saying that maybe you want to know if the invitation for Christmas still stands. Well, I, I was going to let that pass, but have you had a chance to talk to the president? <laughs> uh, no updates on no updates. Uh, on okay. scheduling. Okay. Uh, in all seriousness. Um, I, w I did ask you yesterday, I didn't want to belabor it after the president came out. He came out while you were mm -hmm. talking about. There's been a lot talked about this week with the president telling CBS that mm -hmm. if you stack up his accomplishments in the first couple of years, it, it's the fourth best in history. He said only Lincoln uh, and a couple others were ahead of it. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how he compares to Sure. Jefferson I mean, this has obviously been um, of great interest in the conservative blogosphere, but the fact of the matter is he has, uh, he was making a point about the, the volume and substance of the legislative accomplishments and the foreign policy accomplishments in his nearly three years in power. He was not making an assertion of uh, uh, that only historians will make about uh, the success or, you know, this was not a comparison of uh, success to other presidencies except, presidencies except in, the, in, in, in this, the significance and substance and size of uh, the legislative accomplishments, whether it's health care reform, which was uh, an effort that took 100 years to accomplish, or the Recovery Act, uh, which was an enormous response to an historic economic crisis, the bailout uh, of the automobile industry, the saving of the American automobile industry against uh, uh, great political opposition, uh, and uh, uh, on the foreign policy front, uh, uh, continuing to take the fight successfully to al-Qaeda uh, embodied uh, most uh, notably in the successful mission to remove Osama bin Laden uh, from the uh, battlefield, uh, the successful efforts that we led uh, to uh, bring uh, the international community uh, behind the effort of uh, the Libyan opposition to remove uh, Muammar Gaddafi from power. Uh, I could go on, and believe me, I will. <laughs> As time permits, but uh, it was it was serial, it was uh, it was within the context of uh, the substance and volume of, of what has happened in the face of enormous challenges uh, in these past nearly three years. Can I just follow up on another subject, which mm -hmm. is uh, there had been commentary a couple of weeks ago, but now it's going to die down because of the payroll tax cut. But but that the president might 
uh, make some recess appointments. And uh, there are a lot of people in both parties wondering, does he reserve that right? I mean, we don't know when they're going to actually recess, I suppose, as we continue to this drags out. But is there a possibility that Richard Cordray could be named? Uh, by recess appointment? Are there people in NLRB? What, what's your sense about that possibility? Well, I don't have any uh, announcements to make or uh, speculation to engage in on that front. I mean, we're not relinquishing any rights here. That's, that's certainly the case. Uh, I would note that it is unfortunate that uh, although uh, uh, we had some significant nominations succeed, many, many others unnecessarily have been blocked. Uh, the the effect of that, whether it's on ambassadorial nominations or judicial nominations, is to uh, is, is very damaging, and uh, it is a constant problem and a growing problem where uh, random senators put holds on nominations that are absolutely uncontroversial, uh, and that that practice should stop. And I think uh, uh, this president will continue to nominate highly qualified people for important positions uh, around our government and our foreign service uh, and onto the bench. Uh, I, you mentioned Richard Cordray, and, and this is a perfect example of an abomination in terms of Senate behavior. He is widely respected, has broad bipartisan support across the country. He is exactly the right person for the job uh, to be the consumer watchdog, uh, the overseer of this agency that is in place to ensure that you know average Americans don't get uh, uh, taken advantage of by financial institutions, that they uh, have an advocate for them here in Washington. Republicans block that because they want to water down Wall Street reforms, reforms that were put in place to help prevent the kind of financial crisis that, uh, you know, almost tipped the global economy into a depression. Seems like a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I did say, Mr. David. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yesterday, the President said he needed the Speaker to do something. The Speaker said, I need the President to do something. My assumption would be the Speaker expected something more than a phone call. He was looking for something from the President as far as negotiations. You say there's nothing to negotiate. The Speaker's in a, in a corner. He's boxed in a corner. Is the President going to do nothing to help the Speaker get out of that corner? The President is doing everything he can to help the American people. The Speaker is very capable of helping himself by calling a vote on the Senate compromise, a compromise that received uh, the support of 80 percent of the Republican senators and even a greater percentage of Democratic senators. Uh, there is a bipartisan compromise available to him as a lifesaver, well, if you will. He's, he's in a box. Is there anything the President well, can do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, the, 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 the important thing here is not uh, who's up and who's down politically, because as I talked about yesterday, we are beginning to see some positive signs in the economy. Well, we are a long way from full economic recovery. But the last thing we need to do is fail to pass a payroll tax cut extension, uh, which would, would have a, a negative impact on the kind of economic growth that we have been seeing and need to continue to see. Uh, it's just wrong on, at every level to prevent this from passing. In North Korea, there were some indications coming out of China that maybe there's some power sharing agreement. What, can you update us on the situation in North Korea? Have you had any kind of communications through intermediaries or the North Korean government itself? All I can say is that we're monitoring the situation closely. Uh, Kim Jong Il had desi designated uh, Kim Jong Un as his official successor, and at this time, we have no indication that that has changed. We hope that the new, the new North Korean leadership will take the steps necessary to support peace, prosperity, and a better future for the North Korean people, including through acting on its commitments to denuclearization. You know, I, as I stressed, I think the day before last, you know, we are in a period of transition. North Korea is in a period of national mourning. Uh, we're monitoring events uh, closely. Uh, we hope uh, that the new leadership will uh, support peace and prosperity and a better pe uh, future, uh, future for its people, and that it will uh, abide by its commitments on denuclearization. And no communication from the North Korean government or intermediaries? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Kristen. Thanks, Jay. Um, on Tuesday, the administration called on the American people to weigh in, um, to lend their voices to this. Realistically speaking, do you think that that's going to help 
break this impasse? And if so, why? I know you just read some testimony. Well, I, I do think it will because, as I've said now for a while, even prior to this current uh, situation, we are optimistic or at least hopeful that Congress will act on some of these common sense, mainstream measures to help grow the economy, help the American people, and improve our econ uh, employment situation, not because we're for them. That's probably a negative in the eyes of the highly politicized and partisan uh, House of Representatives and the Republican Party, but because their constituents are demanding it. Uh, and I, and you know, I, I, I of course, I don't have uh, a ton of data here, but I suspect that the voices that we're hearing from uh, by people who are responding uh, to uh, the uh, hashtag $40 uh, that we started yesterday, you know, that, that they are representative of, of folks around the country in the districts of House Republicans as well as uh, Democrats in the states uh, uh, all over the country, you know, who, who, for whom $40 a paycheck is a big deal. That it, it, it means the difference uh, for someone from North Carolina, it's the, that $40 buys my gas for a week to drive to work or it buys my groceries for a week. It's hard enough making ends meet and $40 is a lot of money to me. In Texas, that is almost one week of groceries for me or how much it costs to fill my gas tank for one and a half weeks or medical co-pays at the specialist office. Which one am I to go without? This is going to hurt. Please don't let this happen. Uh, look, I, I, I think that the thousands of responses we've had so far are representative of the hundreds of thousands and millions of responses you would get if you were and if the members of the House of Representatives uh, were to um, survey their own constituents. For most people, $1,000 out of their paycheck next year is an enormous hit. And in this economy, we cannot let that happen. And yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, a senior military commander suggested that troops might need to, in fact, stay, American forces might need to, in fact, stay beyond 2014. Can you respond to that? And is that a possibility? <coughs> well, I appreciate the question. Thank you, Kristen. The, the, as established in Lisbon, uh, at, the, at NATO and as m made clear through the President's uh, Afghanistan policy, uh, one, we are in the process of drawing down the surge, and by the end of 2014, we will have turned over full security lead to Afghan forces. We have made clear all along that uh, much as in Iraq, when we turned over full security lead to the Iraqi forces, uh, that would be part of a process that w may include uh, s uh, troops in support. But make no mistake, and I have an announcement to make, which is that we have met the commitment to reduce, uh, by the end of this year, uh, our forces by 10,000 uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, as we begin to reduce the surge forces, as the President committed to do. And uh, we will continue that process. And when the surge forces are out between that end date, which I guess is September of next year, through the end of 2014, there will be a continued reduction in U.S. forces as we turn over more and more of the country to Afghan security lead. Uh, that has ver been clearly spelled out uh, from Lisbon on. Uh, so that. Uh, and is entirely consistent with what uh, General Allen said. And so just to put a point on it, the commander was wrong, was not on to... No, no, I said it's entirely consistent with what Gen General Allen said. That the process of turning over entirely the security lead to the Afghans uh, is the result of a gradual um, reduction of forces and a building up of Afghan security forces. Uh, we have said uh, from the beginning that there could be U.S. forces uh, in Afghanistan beyond the end of 2014 in a support role, just as they were after August 2010 in a support role in Iraq. Uh, from that point forward in Iraq, we have drawn down now to zero in accordance with our uh, 
agreement with the Iraqi government. So uh, that is entirely consistent. Yes, I did. Um, back on the payroll tax cut for a second, a follow-up to David's question. Put yourself in the speaker's shoes. Are you suggesting that he cobbled together maybe a House majority of willing Democrats and whatever Republicans he might be able to get to go along, even if it goes against the majority of his own caucus in the House? Am I suggesting that for the sake of 160 million people, he should allow this vote to happen and allow his uh, House Republicans to vote their conscience, which would result because of overwhelming Democratic support in the passage of the Senate bill? Yes. That's one way he could do it. Absolutely. It, that's the reason why they didn't vote on it the other day, because it would have passed. Uh, and, that, and that's the, the, the shame of all this. There are, I'm confident, more than enough House Republicans who want to uh, bring this to an end, who want to ensure that Americans don't have their taxes go up on January 1st, and certainly don't want to explain to their constituents why uh, they took a vote so that their taxes would go up. Uh, and if, that, if it came to the floor of the House, it would pass. It would have near unanimous support from Democratic members, and I am confident that the 30-odd Republicans it would require to pass this measure uh, would vote yes, at least. Uh, and, and then we can move on to, to, the, to the next thing that we all agree on, which is that we have to get this payroll tax cut and unemployment insurance extended for the full year. Uh, yes? Like spark a revolt within his own caucus? <laughs> The president has an enormous amount of responsibilities. Every president does. He, he cannot be responsible for the internal politics of uh, the other party in one House of Congress. He is simply focused on doing what is best for the American people and working with Republicans as well as Democrats uh, to achieve what's best for the American people. And that's what the bipartisan compromise reached in the Senate represents. Ninety percent of the United States Senate on a substantive issue, an important issue like this, is quite an accomplishment. Senators McConnell and Reid deserve a lot of credit for the uh, work they did and not, and on achieving the two-month extension and on uh, the progress they made towards a full-year extension. And, and so the House should act on that. It doesn't happen that often when we have this kind of bipartisan consensus on an important issue. We should act on it. Yes, sir. I'm uh, just trying to get a little bit better sense of what happens next. As you said, the ball is in the <coughs> House's court. Um, did the President set any time, did, did he and Boehner set any time to, to talk again, or is this, the, is this the time, the time that's behind you here on this clock? There is nothing more I can read out to you from the conversation with the Speaker of the House. He, the President was very clear, and I, and I provided you the essence of what he said to the Speaker. Um, there is an available solution. The House should pass the two-month extension to ensure that Americans' taxes don't go up. The President, uh, as he has repeatedly, affirmed his commitment to a one-year extension. He, after all, started this conversation and has been pushing for a full-year extension since September. So, uh, and there is a way to get there. And this President and Democrats uh, have been uh, clearly willing to compromise, to, to accept that they could not get Republican support for what we believed and they believed was the right thing to do, which was ask the 300,000 wealthiest Americans, millionaires and billionaires all, to pay a little bit more so that 160 million Americans got a tax cut. Uh, but since Republicans opposed that almost unanimously, uh, Senate Democrats, with this President's full support, were able to work out a compromise with Senate Republicans uh, that included pay-fors uh, that we found acceptable and that made sense as a policy matter that did not uh, violate the President's principles in terms of doing damage to the economy or harming the very people you're trying to help with the payroll tax cut extension or uh, with unemployment insurance. So why did he decide to call Boehner? When you were asked yesterday if he was going to be calling Boehner, you laughed it off. Well, no, I didn't laugh it off. I simply said that uh, there was an available action here that the House should pass the Senate bill. The President speaks with Speaker Boehner periodically. Uh, he called him to urge him to do the right thing here, which is bring up the Senate bill in the House, which is something he can still do, contrary to some tweets I've seen out there. He, they absolutely can uh, take up the Senate bill 
and pass it. Uh, it will be signed by this president um, gladly. Margaret, and then uh, I'm sorry. Then I Margaret. Then in the back, and then I'll keep. I'll jump around. Laura, you know, <laughs> settle in, folks. I'm gonna like take a stab at this, but I feel like it may not work. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I feel like we're all caught in the middle of basically a game where I'm wonder. Are you guys just sort of making the House Republicans twist in the wind a little bit more, and then this is gonna get worked out? It just seems if the president it's was really done with it, wouldn't he just be on a plane to Hawaii right now? The, the, I don't have any scheduling updates to give you. The President just got off the phone within the last hour now with the Speaker of the House, urging him to do the right thing to take up the Senate bill. This is not about, like, look, there's a clear avenue here. You know, we're shining a light on the path out of this, you know, uh, cul-de-sac that they've driven themselves into, and it is to vote on a bill that we're not asking them to vote on a bill that only Democrats supported. We're asking them to vote yes on a bill that 82 percent or something or 80 percent of Senate Republicans supported. That's, that's, it seems not that much of an ask. Doesn't the, doesn't the House's way out of it now effectively do that with just sort of a, a little bit more so that their members could vote for it? And I mean, in the end, if what you really want is just a resolution, doesn't that resolve it without really undercutting the, the places where you guys want to pull from? Doesn't what resolve it? Um, a two-month a, a two month extension with some language that <coughs> requires a year-long deal. I mean, isn't that... Well, just, it doesn't seem that out of reach. Well, I don't know what that means, requires a year-long deal on whose terms. I mean, you saw what the House Republicans put out yesterday and clearly demonstrating that this is not about a payroll tax cut for them. It's about trying to get some political victories on ideological issues. So they, they took the willingness that Senate Democrats demonstrated and this President demonstrated to accept their totally extraneous provision on Keystone and decided that that wasn't enough. They'd ha they wanted a little more and they wanted a bunch of other things that simply moved them away from bipartisanship, moved them away from compromise. So, uh, you know, the President's committed to a full year extension. He has demonstrated his willingness to, to agree to uh, pay for that are different from the ones he put forward and from the ones that Senate Democrats put forward. But they have to make sense. They have to make economic sense and they have to make uh, sense in terms of the impact on uh, average Americans out there. So they should pass the two month and then we can get to negotiating the year long. On Iraq, um, uh, the Vice President uh, made uh, a couple of phone calls yesterday and uh, I guess I'm just wondering <coughs> Is the president, has the president or has Vice President uh, Biden spoken with the Vice President of Iraq? What is, what was the point of those calls? What does, is, how does President Obama feel about the arrest of the charges against his Vice President? And <coughs> what, if anything, at this point can the U.S. do about it? Are you considering um, pulling aid? If you're not, if we're not there, well, Mark, let, me, let me stop you there. First of all, I think we read out some of the calls that the Vice President made separately. This kind of political turmoil has been occurring in Iraq periodically as they have, you know, taken steps forward and occasionally steps backward, but generally made progress towards political reconciliation, towards democracy, and away from the use of violence uh, in pursuit of political ends. That has been progress, but it has often been uh, hard won. That will continue. We certainly expect that uh, there will be difficult days ahead in Iraq, but the progress has been substantial. What is utterly nonsensical is the suggestion that somehow we should have left troops in there and that would have had any impact on the political disputes because maybe folks weren't paying attention, but political disputes have been happening while there were 40,000 troops, 80,000 troops, 150,000 troops. The key metric here is that those political disputes uh, have increasingly been resolved through negotiation, not through violence, and uh, elections were held, a government was established. Uh, these are all signs of important progress, all while violence declined significantly. We will continue to have a robust and important relationship with Iraq. We will continue to have uh, frequent, I'm sure, discussions with Iraqi leaders, and we will continue to weigh in 
uh, and encourage Iraqi leaders to make uh, smart decisions uh, as they uh, continue to move forward with the development of their democracy. Um, I wanted to, as long as we're on foreign policy, I just want to be clear on a question that Kristen had about Afghanistan. That I just want to say on, on 2014, the President will make his decisions on the size and shape of our post-September uh, 2012 presence after the reduction of the surge forces at the appropriate time in consultation with our Afghan and NATO partners. Any post-2014 presence would, of course, be at the invitation of the Afghan government and would ensure that we will be able to target terrorists and support a sovereign Afghan government so that our enemies cannot outlast us. I just want to be clear about that. But the, but the framework that I discussed at the top was laid out at Lisbon. Uh, I think I owe you. Yes, Leslie. Uh, can I ask a quick question following on Margaret's question? Um, do you have any reaction to the Prime Minister's sort of suggestions today that he wants to shed some of the members of the coalition government that he might not necessarily get along with? Um, I, look, we have, uh, I, I would refer you, I don't have it in front of me, to, um, we did a readout of the Vice President's calls, yes, uh, to that statement. Um, and, uh, you know, we have worked, the Vice President has, and other members of the President's team have, uh, with Iraq on uh, the political process. It is very important and has been and will continue to be that uh, Iraqi leaders uh, pursue a representative uh, government uh, so that everyone's interests are properly represented. And, uh, you know, but beyond that, I would just refer you to the, to the statement we put out. He said that the U.S. had asked him to free some of the Hashimi guards that he had jailed. Who did? Um, he said that the U.S. government had asked him to free some. Uh, Maliki did. I just, I, again, I, don't, I just don't have anything more on that for you today. Yes, Alexis. And then Anne. Two, two quick questions. Can and I just you know what I did? Alexis and then yes, sorry, tell me, uh, John. John, of course. Okay, two, Alexis two and John. Two questions. Um, I want to clarify that you were reading these moving comments from people who talk about what they could do with forty dollars. The president had originally asked for the three point one percent an expansion. Is when he's thinking about uh, getting a year extension. I just want to clarify. He's still talking about sticking with an extension, not an expansion, considering that they would get sixty bucks. Paycheck, well, no right? question, but that was part of, and I'm glad you mentioned it, Alexis, because but that was part of our he's compromise. He's not going to argue for that. If he gets the two months uh, insurance, he's not going to then say, okay, look, let's let's go back to talking about expanding this. Well, well, I don't, I don't want to predict, but he may say that that would be a good thing to do, but he is absolutely willing to sign a uh, appropriately paid for one-year extension of the payroll tax cut at its current levels. Uh, he, you're absolutely right, initially supported an expansion of that, and as part of the compromise, the, the de you know, another data point in my uh, uh, presentation on the, the, the ways in which the President and Senate Democrats have compromised in these negotiations, you know, the, and, that com and the way that that compromise has led to uh, a result that uh, garnered uh, a vote of 89 to 10 in the Senate, I mean, I think that's, that's again, a demonstration of his understanding that in a divided government, uh, you know, you don't get everything you want. And uh, he was willing, he is very willing to sign into law this two-month extension that was uh, passed by the Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support. And he's very eager to work with Congress to uh, continue the progress that Senators McConnell and Reid made uh, towards extending it for a full year at its current level. Uh, he believed and still believes, of course, that more would be better. Uh, but what absolutely must not happen is that nothing is passed by the House and taxes go up. Okay. Well, let me ask another question to follow up on Ed real quick. Ed's question about the President's sense of history and where he fits into it. Mm -hmm. In my previous experience covering the White House, most Presidents get that information from somebody who does that analysis for them, somebody from, from a historian or a political mm -hmm. scientist or political advisor. Can you tell us where that assessment came from? Did the President do it himself? <laughs> I, the President is a well-read individual uh, and uh, was prior to coming to office and reads uh, voraciously yeah. in office. So, um, no. I mean, I think that's, look, I, I think that's an assessment that others may have made on the outside simply by the sheer volume of what uh, has been accomplished by this President and by Congress. Uh, in the last three years, 
and, and part of the size of the record, again, and, and voters will judge it and historians will judge it in terms of uh, where it fits in terms of uh, American history and its relative success or greatness. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about, uh, you know, he came into office and working with Congress, uh, facing enormous challenges for this country. Uh, an economy in free fall, the, 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 the real threat of a global depression, two wars, and enormous challenges elsewhere in foreign affairs. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, with Congress, took action to deal with them. That's what the Times demanded. And, and, and Congress uh, passed some very big pieces of legislation that did big things. Wall Street reform, uh, the, the, the successfully sa saving the American automobile industry, the Recovery Act, health care reform. Uh, and, and then, of course, as I mentioned, a number of foreign policy Successes successfully and responsibly ending the war in Iraq, beginning the drawdown in Afghanistan, taking the fight aggressively to Al Qaeda, repositioning ourselves, reorienting ourselves uh, as a as a, to reassert ourselves as a Pacific player in power, uh, because of the neglect that uh, uh, the prior administration had towards Asia. Um, these are all part. You know, these are all big things, and 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 you all and your your. Uh, successors and historians will judge uh, the success of the things that he's done. And voters most will have an opportunity, obviously, to do that in less than a year. Uh, but there's no arguing about the, the, the volume and, the, and the, 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 lar the, the, the substantial nature of what has been done. We just had the Speaker's office put out a little readout of the call, and they're saying that Speaker Boehner appears to be dug in as well, just as the President was on the two month. Speaker Boehner is saying, bring the Senate back, appoint the conferees, what we've, what we've heard before. And the quote from the Speaker's office is that the Speaker said, let's get it done today. So where are we? We seem to be at the same spot. Uh, today, Congressman, uh, Congressman Van Hollen and Hoyer, if I'm not mistaken, attempted to bring up the Senate bill in the House, and they were gaveled down by Republican congressmen. That opportunity is there. If, if, if the Speaker wants to get it done today, I'm sure we can get it done today. We can pass the two-month extension. So I have, one year to well, you know, he knows, and the President made very clear to him, that the avenue available to him, the Speaker of the House, to avoid raising taxes on 160 million Americans is to pass the measure that won overwhelming bipartisan support in the Senate. This sudden insistence on like the uncertainty created by a two month extension. It's just you guys know you've been covering this. You know that it's it's it just doesn't ring true, right? I mean this was the, the same leadership that thought it would be a good idea for the global and American economy to have periodic fights and stalemates over and brinkmanship over defaulting on the full faith and credit of the United States government. Talk about uncertainty. The uncertainty that we have to eliminate is the uncertainty that Americans have right now about whether or not their taxes are going to go up on January 1st. There is a bipartisan compromise available to make sure that doesn't happen. Just take it. Just take it. <coughs> Follow the advice of numerous Republican senators. Follow the advice of the Wall Street editorial page. Words I never thought I'd speak. <laughs> Follow the advice of Senators McCain and Corker and Grassley and others and pass the bipartisan compromise. Make sure that Americans don't have their taxes go up on January 1st. Since Dan. Since the Speaker has now responded to your statement and says that the, he wants the President to urge Senator Reid to appoint conference, isn't this the classic definition of a stalemate or a deadlock? Well, it's a classic conference. Uh, you know, there is a stalemate in that the Speaker will not act. A bipartisan compromise was negotiated, and as you know and reported on, it was supported overwhelmingly by Republicans in s the Senate. It was the product of a negotiation that the Speaker of the House helped initiate and urged to happen. It was a product that the Speaker of the House endorsed to his own colleagues on a conference call, as has been widely reported. It is a product that has the support of Republicans uh, in, in, in the Senate, in the House, outside. Uh, in conservative circles, uh, it should just get done. 
and I, I you know what is absolutely uh, the wrong way to look at this and and would be a disservice to readers and viewers would be to say both sides are to blame neither side wants to compromise Democrats won't move and Republicans won't move no that's not the story of what happened here in the Senate Democratic leaders, Republican leaders, got together, worked out a compromise that won overwhelming support from Republicans and Democrats. That's the kind of stuff people are dying to see in Washington. And it worked. The president supports it. For a while, it seemed, or 24 hours there, it seemed like House leaders in the Republican Party supported it. Until, I guess, they were told not to by a sub-faction or some representation, some sizable group within the House Republican Conference. But that's not, they're not speaking for the overwhelming majority of the American people, Republicans in the country, for, uh, certainly for their colleagues in the Senate, all of whom want them to pass this bipartisan sensible compromise to ensure that Americans don't have their taxes go up, and, and then, as everybody has agreed on, to then refocus our efforts on getting a full year extension. Uh, there, there's, there, that's the way out here. There is a bill. There is a bipartisan compromise available. The negotiation has happened. He sat down with Senator McConnell and Senator Reid and, and and urged that process to begin. They worked hard on a year long. When they felt like they couldn't do it by the end of the year, they recommended this two year comp two month compromise. Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly agreed. They should take it up and pass it. Laura? Two questions. One is, can you tell us how long the conversation lasted with the speaker? About 10 minutes. I, I don't have an exact uh, time for you, but it seemed like about 10 minutes. Uh, so obviously more was said than what you said in the readout if it was 10 minutes long. I, I'm not going to give you a transcript, if that's what you mean. But look, the president. The, the, I, I mean, I, the, the, the president was very clear in uh, stating uh, what I told you he said. Uh, you know, I don't think he could be any clearer. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is both sides have now put out readouts where they say that their principles essentially reiterated their public positions. Mm -hmm. um, my question is whether in this conversation there was any hope for advancing this beyond the publicly stated position of each side. Again, I, I, I've given you the readout. It, there, there aren't. It, it, it is a, it is an absolutely fair representation of, of uh, what the president said, and I leave it to the speaker to, to characterize what he said. But what I described to you is exactly what the president said. It is exactly his position. It is his public position and it is his private position. Uh, the House should take up the Senate compromise. But you've talked a lot about how. Everyone's committed to a year-long deal, and we'll get that done, but we just need to get mm -hmm. past this crisis moment. Mm -hmm. What makes you think that it's going to be so easy to get a year-long <coughs> deal, given that you, with all due respect, the parties have failed to do so until now? Well, Senators Reid and McConnell made progress. That process needs to continue. Mm -hmm. the, the ways, there are ways to do this that are not difficult. Uh, they represent choices, uh, but there are ways to pay for this uh, that uh, the president can accept, Democrats can accept, and we see no reason why Republicans wouldn't accept. The issues that they put forward in their whatever that thing is that they voted on yesterday so that they could avoid actually voting on the bill uh, were filled with things that had nothing to do with a payroll tax cut. Nothing at all. So, do you think that you're going to be able to get past all those things that have nothing to do with the payroll tax when you start negotiating in January? Well, again, I think that uh, the voices of the people from West Virginia, Texas, Connecticut, and everywhere else are going to be heard. But, but, but let's be clear. Great progress was made in the Senate. There are ways to do this for a year that everybody, we believe, can agree on, certainly at least the President, Senate Republicans, and Senate Democrats as well as House Democrats. I mean, there's one, speaking of isolation, I mean, there's one isolated group here. 
that doesn't want to join the overwhelming majority of Democrats and Republicans who support doing one thing on behalf of the American people. Uh, increasingly, I think that isolation is, is, is becoming clear. And, and, uh, and I expect that House Republicans will be hearing from their constituents and maybe from uh, other folks whose opinion they respect. And maybe that will have a, an effect. It, you know, the politics of this are really so far less important than the substance here. Because as I think Jessica pointed out early on in the briefing, there is an absolute economic impact to failing to act here. There's a macroeconomic impact, a reduction of economic growth by up to 5.5 percent. Uh, that would have a direct effect on employment. It would be a, a, a terrible and direct effect on those who would no longer receive unemployment insurance as they're trying to meet their house payments and pay their bills while they're looking for a job. And all of that, the withdrawal of all of those uh, resources from the economy would, would, would be negative. And the, the, you know, the, the, the effect on individuals of uh, losing $40 in their paycheck, every paycheck, is real and harmful at this time where we're still in a, a, a fragile stage of our economic recovery, where things are getting better but are far from good enough. The last thing Congress should do is in an act of total disregard for a bipartisan consensus, total disregard for the effect it would have on 160 million people, refuse to vote on this compromise. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jerry. Um, Sorry, Don, it took me so long. No, but that's all right. Um, it seems that the payroll tax cut is going to expire, whether it's 10 days from now or, or two months or a year from now. And you just spoke about the impact that mm -hmm. it would have uh, if it's not extended on middle class families, 160 million taxpayers no. out there. Has the president or his economic team given any thought to making this payroll tax cut permanent? No. Uh, why not? Because it was, the, specific, the, it was specifically the, the designed just, yeah. to, a year ago, working with Republican leaders, designed to give the economy uh, at that moment the boost that it needed. And again, notwithstanding those who uh, choose to ignore basic economic facts and call themselves economists nevertheless, uh, it has had a very positive impact this year on the economy, both on growth and job creation, and uh, would continue to have that. Now, at some point, you know, you, you, you hope that the recovery is at a stage where uh, we would no longer need that added help. Uh, that's why it is a one-year measure. The, again, the, the debt ceiling, the, the, the willingness to go through a debt ceiling showdown every three or six months, you know, I think makes clear that their concern about, the stated concern about uh, uncertainty is um, suspicious, to say the least. But, the, but there's also, like, Republicans overwhelmingly supported the temporary Bush tax cuts, right? So, this is a real-world impact. This is not an esoteric exercise. It's not a political exercise. It's, a, it's a, a, a bill that would either provide Americans with an extra $40 per paycheck or take it away. And Americans who live paycheck to paycheck and Americans who are uh, doing a little bit better than that and saving a little bit uh, will have to r change their budgeting next year if the House walks away from this bipartisan compromise that 80 percent of Senate Republicans support. But for some reason, the House Republican leaders don't. So if the President and the administration believes then that a year from now, those taxpayers that you referenced will be able to handle that $40 hit in their paychecks? Are, well, there, there are a lot of things that, there's a lot of water to pass under the bridge economically between now and a year from now. There are a lot of, as you know, reporting as you do on these issues, uh, a lot of other things that will have to be decided next year economically that will have potentially an effect on tax rates and, uh, and a number of issues economically. We will also certainly hope that the, I'm not here making any kind of economic prediction about growth or anything, but except to say that you know, we need to take the measures we can take to help the recovery along 
uh, to, 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 to give it the kind of momentum that will lead to uh, the kind of economic growth that will bring down the unemployment rate and put people back to work and eventually get us to a point uh, where, yes, we would not need that kind of uh, measure that, uh, that we need now and that Americans need now. All right. Got Bo, these fine dog stuff, you get pizza and stuff. So what's the I'm take what's the symbolism? Personally what's looking forward to a little of that pizza <laughs> having that headline. But yeah. it'll be cold by the time we get to it. What's the, what symbolism, if any, should we read into it? Is the message that the dog is the president's best friend because it's Washington this time of year? Is the message that everyone should go out and spend is the message that everyone should go out and spend money before Christmas? Is the message that is there no message, and this is just the first time that he's had a chance to go shopping? Well, what is your message that he, can do, he can't get anything done until Congress acts, so he might as well go shopping? Right. <laughs> it's multiple choice. Go with it. Hashtag 40. Uh, I wouldn't vote for <laughs> and, an, and an expensive chew toy. Yeah, I think, I think Scott did my work for me there. So, no, the, uh, I, I would refer you to the pool report. Um, I was here as this. Uh, OTR, as we call them, was happening. Um, the president's obviously very busy here. Shortly before making that excursion, he was on the phone with uh, Senator Reid and Speaker Boehner. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to get out of the House. Thanks very much.